Hey everyone, this is George Carose coming at you with, I think, the fourth episode of iMOOC. We've had Joe Bowler, Alice Keeler, Katie Martin, or Tara Martin, uh, but Katie Martin's been in all of them. And uh, I am really excited tonight because not only do we have a visionary leader joining us as well, uh, we have a, one someone who I consider one of my best friends in the world, uh, Patrick Larkin. He's an amazing superintendent. Uh, I met him when he was a principal. and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that he did um, when he was a principal as well as a superintendent. Um, but really excited to be able to talk to you. He is from Boston, hence the reason I'm wearing my New York Yankees hat, giving him a little bit of a hard time. Uh, but we're really excited to have you. And so, uh, Katie, if you could say hi, and then uh, Patrick, if you can introduce yourself. All right. Welcome, everybody. We're excited for the fourth episode. Um, just again, want to say thank you to everybody for your blogs. We love all the comments. Uh, want to give a shout out to those of you who have been doing your video reflections. I did mine this afternoon, had to push myself. Um, so keep them coming, keep commenting on one another's. It's so great to hear your thoughts and hear um, how your thinking is changing as a result of engaging with this awesome community. And we're super excited to have Patrick here tonight to share his thoughts and ideas. So Patrick, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself, tell a little bit about who you are and what you do, and then we'll get into a great conversation. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, George. And thanks for the Yankee hat. Um, I would have worn my Red Sox hat, but we're on, we're on to football season in Boston, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but that Yankee team is a tough team to dislike, so people may disagree me, with me around here. But um, I do want to clarify, I'm an assistant superintendent, superintendent. Um, Eric Conti, who's uh, a visionary leader as well, so I'm really fortunate in that regard. But uh, I work in Burlington, Massachusetts, and we're just a short distance outside of Boston. We're a suburb with uh, about 3,600 kids in six schools, four elementary schools, one middle school, one high school. Our high school is right around 1,000 students. And um, again, we've been trying to do some of the things that uh, George talks about in the Innovator's Mindset. We've been uh, a one-to-one -one district now, I want to say eight years. Students in grades one through 12 have their own device uh, in school. And we were one of the first schools in Massachusetts to go that way. Um, we're pretty fortunate to have a tax base in Burlington. So um, we haven't dealt with some of the budget issues that some of our neighbors have and other people have across the country. Uh, but again, I'm happy to be here and certainly tough shoes to follow uh, the first three weeks. I've been listening and uh, some, some great people and a little value to the to this as well. And I was wondering, George, can I use this as my vlog for the week? Will this count no. As, as my... No. no you got to actually do it on your own. I don't, I don't know if you know how to use Twitter yet, so I'm going to just confirm with that. So... <laughs> Patrick is actually uh, Patrick actually listens to uh, all the podcasts on his way to work. He told me so um, this week. He kind of pushed me to make sure I do one for him, so I gave him a little shout outs. But hey, Patrick, I want to actually ask you something about when you went one to one. Uh, what are the devices that you're using one to one in your school district right now? Yeah, so right now we have a little bit of a mix. We're mostly iPads um, in our freshman class this year at the high school. The principal decided to give them all Chromebooks. But just to go back to the time when we were making the decision, I was really fortunate to have uh, a group of high school students as part of the decision-making process along with teachers and community members. And it was before there were iPads. It was actually the year before the iPads came out to go in school. So we did have some iPads to test out. There were no Chromebooks at the time. There were a lot of netbooks. So the high school students were actually the ones that decided on the iPads. Uh, and again, that was at the high school and since we've integrated in in grades uh, K to 12. But the high school students were, were a key part of that whole thing. And because they all had their iPhones, which again is just a little bit of a smaller iPad, they, they really, um, the teachers were a little uncomfortable going with a tablet, but the kids told us that things were going to go smoothly, that the kids would help the teachers along the way and the transition couldn't have gone better. And I think Again, it's because we had the, the students so heavily involved in that. And, and I think that's a really important conversation because uh, there's a lot of schools that, you know, uh, they'll go one-to-one -one or they'll 
use Office 365 or Google Apps or whatever. And a lot of times, and this is not to crap on any one of those technologies, but a lot of times when uh, school districts um, go Office 365, the the reasoning is because that's the what the IT department is most comfortable with. And when they go Google Apps, a lot of times it's because that's what the, the teachers and the students are most comfortable with. And so I, I really appreciate. Now, if you went Office 365, which I think is great because that's what your teachers and students were asking for, I think that's a really important thing because you have to understand what are the people using that you're serving, not what, what works best for you. So I really appreciate that you shared that actually students had input in in the in the conversation to where they're actually going yeah and we knew that whatever we chose that wasn't going to be a permanent fix like so many things in schools have been like we made a choice 50 years ago and that's the way we do business um, as we know with technology it's changing so fast uh, we know it's going to be an iterative process for us and our ultimate goal is wherever our kids end up they're going to be able to figure out Whatever the tools are that are thrown at them, whatever the devices that they have to work on, um, our goal is to have them be comfortable with that. I love that, and you mentioned that a lot. That the you asked the kids what they what they wanted, and you brought them into the process. And I think that gets lost a lot in times, and I don't think it's intentional. But we get moving on these um, new initiatives, and and forget to ask kids, and forget to ask the people who are actually going to be using them what makes the most sense and how, how they will be the most effective. But how, like, that's, that's what drives me crazy. Like, how do you just forget? <laughs> oh, whoops. We just implemented all these things for every classroom and we forgot to ask you. Like, that is just ridiculous. Like, that, to me, is something that I see all the time and it drives me insane because, the, like, we always, a lot of times we get on teachers for making decisions based on what their best interests are, not necessarily the kids. But then a lot of times the decisions that are made are in what's best interest for the adults in central office, not necessarily what works for the teachers and the students. So I think, yeah, like yeah. to me that's unacceptable. I to, remember, to, I remember uh, one example of a, the, the kid saved us thousands of dollars too because one of the questions came up, right, we decided on the iPad and then the adults at the table are like, all right, what type of case should we get for the iPads? And one of the kids who was going to be a senior the following year said, don't get us cases. We're going to take them off anyway and put on what we want to put on them. So again, talk about a thousand iPads times whatever the case would have cost. And the kids saved us thousands of dollars and we didn't get cases. What we ended up doing was getting these sleeves that the iPads could go in with local businesses had their names on the sleeves and the kids could fit the uh, iPad in the sleeve with whatever case they chose to get. So um, again, they, not only are they, they smart, um, they can save us a lot of money when we ask them their opinion sometimes. Absolutely. A lot of times that's funny, like people say we ask kids and you know sometimes they ask for opinions and don't always use them. Um, so I think it's really powerful to show kids how they saved you money and how their input really influenced decisions. Um, but one thing I want to bring up and it's kind of it's the blog um, conversation or the blog topic for this week about relationships and we were talking about this earlier. You can't just ask for opinions or get input if you don't have relationships with people. Um, the kids may not trust you to give their actual feedback if they don't really think you care. So I'm curious, Patrick, on your thoughts um, that we should put out to everyone this week. We said relationships are brought up a lot. They're a big deal. We talk about them a lot. Um, what is your take on why they're so important to innovation? Again, I mean, the well, key word is trust, right? And we can say we, you know, we have an open door and you can tell us anything, but um, it's, I think it's easier as a building principal and it's harder as a central office administrator. And when I say that, this is my own weakness. Like you need to be out in schools, talking to principals, talking to teachers. You need to be accessible. You can't say, oh, I have an open door, but nobody ever came in. Um, the relationships thing, first of all, is trust locally with your teachers, with your stakeholders, with your students. But then the other thing about innovation, as I was thinking about it, and again, my relationship with George is um, is an example of that. Like I've had somebody I could reach out to and talk to if I have an issue I'm dealing with. Like George, you'll tell me if I'm way off on my thoughts. Um, and a lot of no, you know, but you need 
you need people that you, so that's the other thing about relationships. Um, it can be a lonely existence, I think, as an administrator sometimes. Um, you can't necessarily, um, you know, share everything that you're going through with, with um, you know, staff, students, and, and community members. So you need to have um, other people you can reach out to. So relationships that you have uh, doing this thing, and this is where I think, again, the power of the technology to connect us with like-minded people, um, you know, and we can be in touch with them with a, with a direct message or a, or a text message. That's really, I think, made my job a lot easier because we, we go from uh, schools where, you know, we don't even talk to the principal next door who lives in the next town over. And uh, so it's a big jump for some people, but just the access through the technology for me has been kind of a game changer um, going back years to that thing George mentioned earlier, Twitter. I think, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, and the I think that when you talk about, especially I've seen this a lot with students and um, and, and teachers, uh, will ask for feedback, which is great. Like we should be asking for feedback and their thoughts, but this happens to students way too often. Is that we will ask for feedback, and we'll say, "Hey, we have a student voice conference. We're gonna get you know kids talking about what school should look like," but then I don't see anything change and like we're patting ourselves on the back because we had the kids uh, talk, but then there's actually no follow up or like, okay, so here's what you said and here's what we did because of what you said. And so now what do you think? Because I think it's not just a like ask and, and you're, and you're good. It has to be like a cycle that you continue to because kids five years from now might want different things. And so is that something that we have a conversation and it's not like, you know, cause you know, every high school had someone run for student president that they're going to say they're going to, you know, an extra hour of lunch and things like that, right? It's not like we just do whatever kids say. Um, and I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is that a lot of times our, the, the people we're asking, we're not giving, we're not actually following up on their feedback and what we've done with implementation. And I think that uh, the example you gave before was really crucial is because, hey, you said this and we did that because of this. And by the way, thanks for saving us a bunch of money. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a huge point. And I think that's the hardest part because I can probably think of a lot of things that, you know, aren't going smoothly in our district or because we haven't followed up on some things that we said we should do. So again, I don't want to um, give the indication that I'm a perfect leader. Um, I think I'm fortunate to be surrounded day to day with a lot of pretty innovative thinkers um, who I work directly with and it was just to amplify their thoughts and to share them and, and try to gain momentum that way because certainly I'm not 100% sure if I've ever had an original thought, to be honest with you, George. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that got me to central office, my lack of original thinking. <laughs> That's true. But hey, speaking of original thinking, you're one of the first people that did this and I think it ties really nicely to relationships. Um, I remember this is really powerful is uh, when you moved your desk. It, can you talk about yeah. that when you were a principal? Because you are talking about relationships and what, what happened there. And, and if you tell people that, I think it's really a powerful story. Yeah, I mean, so there was this hashtag on Twitter called No Office Day. So everybody was talking about, you know, how great it is to get out of your office for a day. We were all writing blog posts about, wow, that was the best day I ever had. I didn't spend any time in my office. So again, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so if one day was great in my office, why do I even go in there at all? So I took uh, residents at a desk in the main lobby of the school right by, you know, everybody that came in. It was where the te near the teacher's mailroom uh, in a high traffic spot. So day to day, I mean, I'd have interaction with a large percentage of our kids and staff. My secretary hated it because she was back in the main office and, and she couldn't see me. So I'd have to wave to her. I would check in with her here and there, but I used to have the door open to my office and I'd see people passing by and that open door policy that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah I have an open door policy, but nobody ever came in. They didn't want to bother me. So just, I think, putting myself out there, um, I was able to be more accessible, and I think conversations on things that were on people's minds than I ever would have if I was spending more time in my office. And again, let's face it, we all have these nice laptops or mobile devices that our district provides us with, or most of us do, 
um, why the hell are you anchored to a desk somewhere in the back where nobody can find you? It makes no sense. Um, so sit out, you can answer emails sitting there in the main lobby of your school and you might have a conversation with a kid or a teacher that you never would have had before. I love that. It makes me think of a conversation we were talking about um, bringing different groups to the table sometimes. And, you know, we all say, my door's open, come on in whenever you want. But this notion of like bringing the table to people and like you just gave an example, bringing your desk to where people are and putting yourself in their spaces so you can have those conversations. And, um, you know, it just makes me think of part of the book too, to innovate, disrupt your routine. So doing something different, and I love that it's not just one day, but how you can do it um, more often. Um, and yeah. and the, more we, the more we get and have conversations and see things differently, we can really think about what else is possible. Yeah, you know what, Katie, that um, changing your routine, I think like you hit upon something that really resonates with me because you know, you think about this is my workflow, this is how I do things. But after, you know, a few years, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, you, you have to mix it up. So I, I really tried this year a little bit more this new journal that I use. And, uh, and I've, I've been getting up early in the morning and kind of outlining my day, um, talking about a couple of things that I'm grateful for. Um, I've tried to ground myself each day and get into a different routine because it gets boring to do the same thing and you're going to get the same results. And I don't think I've, I've been as effective in some areas as I would like to be from getting up in the morning and kind of articulating my day to myself and putting it out on paper. And then at the end of the day, I spend a few minutes, you know, before bed checking in on, all right, how did I do on these key things that I wanted to accomplish today? Um, I think it keeps me on track too. And to be honest, um, technology is, um, I, I find myself, I think I was getting distracted too much by it sometimes. So I've tried to uh, turn off all the notifications and kind of decide to myself, this is when I'm going to go on social media. This is when I'm going to do email. I'm not going to be in an important meeting somewhere and have things that are popping up that are going to, that might take my attention away from the people that are right in front of me. So that's been something that I've really had to be reflective on myself. And I, and I, I think it's, I'm still a work in progress when it comes to that. But I think it's really, I think it's really important because um, I think it's something our kids are dealing with and it's something that we need to model to, for them. And I think we need to talk to them about what we're doing and how we're managing this, because that's going to be a huge part of um, that's going to make them successful when they get to the next step, wherever that's going to be. And I live with uh, three, three kids, um, six kids, sometimes three kids, other times um, who are, who I like to, you know, look how they interact with things and, and what are the rules? And I think we, even though this stuff's been around for a little while, um, we need to talk to parents and communities about um, how this stuff impacts our kids because it can be a point of contention for some. So that's a really good point. There's a lot of things that I definitely love the journaling and the goal setting. I think that's really powerful and I could use some, some work in that. So thanks. Where, where, where's the link to your journal? Where can we find it online? <laughs> What? <laughs> He's got to the dark side. How I'm, do I know I'm, if you're I'm learning a pen and paper? Share it openly. No, it's all, and I think, sorry, I started, I just had to throw in that joke. But I, that actually, I, I, I've started, I probably started doing that about um, six months ago. And I don't write in a journal, but I write somewhere uh, on my phone privately because I always have it. And it's hard for me to carry pen and paper with the amount of travel. But yeah, it's really kind of grounds you for sure to, to do those things. Sorry, Katie, I, I had I had to make that joke. So no, I, don't get, I don't get to be funny very often, so. <laughs> no, but I mean, I know we all go to meetings, right? And um, we're sitting at a meeting. It's great everybody has these devices, but I look around the table sometimes at meetings where we're discussing things that I think might be somewhat important and everybody's got their laptop open, which may be fine, but I do think a lot of them are, you know, answering e emails or, they're not really present for what the conversation is. So for myself, I'm not going to tell other people what they have to do. Um, I, I tend not to um, use the laptop in those types of meetings and I'll take some notes. And I found again, I, that I do have a better sense of what happened in meetings when I'm more focused on pen and paper. So there, I put it out there. <laughs> so um, that's a really interesting, just, Point. And I think that we all are distracted. There's no doubt about it. But I also don't know the, for me, 
if it's just the technology. Sometimes I see people distracted. They're doodling in their notebook and they're doing other things. So I think it's an easy out sometimes to say we're distracted by the technology instead of, I think what you did is reframe your focus and talk about goals yeah. and setting that, which I think is powerful and we can all do that. But Katie, just so I'm no, saying, Katie, that's a good, go ahead. I was going to say something too. I, I think ahead, that you have to be very careful when you say someone's distracted by doodling because somebody actually, that's how they pay attention. And so <laughs> there is, there is where I know that I have to manipulate things to, to actually listen. That if I'm looking at you, the chance of me, if I'm just looking at you and staring at you, the chance that I'm actually listening to you is very low. Or that chance that I'm understanding what you're talking about. And, and I've had this conversation with a lot of people is that when we say the words pay attention, what we mean is eyes on me, sit and just look at me. And, you know, a lot of times I do that and I have no idea what just happened. I have no clue. And so I think that we have to help people find what works with them. Uh, because like I know that a lot of times it's hard for me to keep it it's it's never been easy for me to keep attention this is long before phones existed by the way and now I'm actually getting to the point where I, I maybe not listen to everything you say but I'm going to dig into some of the things that you're saying and go deeper and I actually got a really long conversation about this is that you need to listen to me a hundred percent of the time because what if you miss something important but if all I get is shallow surface level stuff but I actually don't dig deep, then, then where is the learning? Where is the connection that I have to make? Now, so, and, and, and to, but to iterate your point, I think that I, I've, seen, I've seen teachers since I started teaching have no interest in whatever's going on and they'll bring a big stack of marking to do and they're not there to like, oh, I need to mark to listen. For the rest right. of it. Yeah. So you yeah, so the illustrating my point exactly is that it's what I didn't mean to say is doodling is distracted is that people make assumptions that it's the device itself that's distracting people when we all have our, our attention elsewhere and sometimes we're totally focused. And I think what I was going to say is that I was at a workshop recently and the instructor said, do not bring devices. Make sure that you pay attention to me the whole time. You have to be here for three days. And I was really irritated because I wanted to be able to take notes. And the assumption was if I had my computer, I wouldn't be able to focus. And I look around the room and there was a lot of attention in different places, but it wasn't because of devices or not. And so I just was making the point of like, we as individuals need to reframe our thinking and focus. And if we're leading learning experiences, think about how we're allowing people to meet their own needs not dictate what it looks like to be engaged in a room. And I think that's, <laughs> I exactly reiterate. No, I agree. I mean, the number one thing we have to do with kids, I think, is to get them to that sense of self-awareness with what works best for them. And if we say like, everybody has to do it this way, or everybody has to do it that way, everybody's doing it the same, then we're not, you know, reaching every kid. We're not letting them all do what's going to work to their strengths. So that again, just, what we said earlier is one of the conversations we had when we went to one, one to one parents were worried kids were going to be distracted. And George made the point already kids were distracted before we had devices um, in the classrooms. I was distracted in 1985 in high school and I didn't even know what a laptop or a smartphone was. So again, it's a good point. I think I've gained a sense of self-awareness that I can't control myself sometimes if I have these notifications popping up. So I'm dealing with me do what's best for them. And I think that's the point. Um, that's what we do in school, right? For so many different things is, you know, this works for me, Katie. So this is the way it should work for everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we missed the boat, whether it comes to uh, flexible seating in classrooms, you know, people are like, oh, we, we got stand up desks. I'm like, great. So now the kids have to stand all day instead of sit all day. Like, let's have flexible options for kids. And mm -hmm. there's so many examples of that. Like, it's great. We get excited but we go all into the extreme and we don't really think about like that might not work best for all 15 or 25 kids in your classroom. Yeah. It's like when the schools all got like exercise balls to sit on for every single kid. I'm like, good luck with that. <laughs> like, I'm not, you know, you gotta have some options. Just kind of building on this conversation. Um, and some people are going to be bothered by them saying this, but it's not meant to insult. It's meant to get you to think uh, oh. a teacher, a teacher asked me, um, we were talking about, you know, social media and the connections and how powerful it can be for learning. And 
she said, well, what do you do if a kid's on their phone, um, you know, while I'm lecturing? And I, and I just said, be less boring. Like we always, we always put it on the students. So like somebody says to me, you can't bring your phone in. I'm like, no problem. Cause I'll leave. Like there, it's not really like, I know it works for me and not, and I'm not saying let kids do whatever they want. Don't be like whatever. But the point is, is that I've seen adults who get paid to go to um, sessions and <clears throat> they don't listen to anything. They're, they're more distracted often than our students are. And, and I, and like, uh, there's, you know, if anyone's seen me present before, I'm very fast. Um, I got a lot of media because I know that most adults, they get bored very quickly. And we were talking about this with um, a group is that somebody said, you know, your, 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 your presentations are really interesting. Like, you know, <clears throat> how did you start learning to do this? And I said, well, you know, like watching really good presenters has really helped me quite a bit. But I think one of the things that's, really interesting is a lot of teachers watch or, or like go to presentations someone uses powerpoint i don't think powerpoint's bad i think how we use it is terrible in many cases and they'll have bullets points and they'll just go oh it's so boring this is so horrible and it's just bullet points but then those same teachers will go teach kids to do powerpoint presentations the exact same boring way they hate and not actually and i'm like like, why would you, like, are you trying to punish them for what you're going through? Or is it like something that, you know, we have to think about, like, this isn't working for the adults, you know, who are paid to be here. This is probably not going to work for your kids that, you know, it, it, they seem like they, they feel like, you know, like, I hate this and I don't want to be here. And it's almost like they're forced. So we really have to think about like that experience from that viewpoint of a learner and what, and help them figure out what works best because, if you put a couch in a room when I was a kid and you put a high table, I'm going to the couch. I'm totally going to the couch, but then I'm not listening to you and I'm going to drift off and probably fall asleep. So you as a teacher are going to say, this is not a good place for you. Maybe you should go to the high, high seat because you need to move around to think. I think that's really important to, maybe it's really important for us to help our kids find that, not just say, what we're, as you said, Patrick, what works for me should work for you. And again, I'm saying this for myself as much as uh, anybody else, but I love how you clarify, like we're all learners in schools, George. And um, for myself, somebody that's in charge of having professional development for teachers, um, guilty like so many times of presenting the way that I would never want a teacher to present in a classroom. So just to keep it in mind, like we have to give more thought to if we want them to do certain things with kids, we have to do a better job of modeling that. When I say we, I know that's, I'm talking to myself. Mm -hmm. It's hard though. I mean, people, we say, go and do this. And we're so, you know, I try to always help people be mindful of, it's not just more content. <clears throat> more content does not necessarily change behavior, but so often we get stuck and I just got to tell everybody all these things and then they'll go and do all these things. Um, and so really, as you said, yeah, it's fast. It's faster. It's faster for me to tell you, Katie, than like, you just struggle and get there on your own, but what's going to reinforce it? And it's the same thing we see again, well-intentioned. I have good intentions, right? But you know, we know that whatever that the phrase about good intentions, but and teachers, they're working hard and they have limited time in their day. So I know sometimes they don't have a chance, like they need to get through things. But again, as school leaders, I think we have to give them the latitude to say, I don't care if you get through it, something that's a little deeper and let the kids struggle and come to that on their own than just giving it to them because they're not going to internalize it that way. Right. Well, and I think like you said, until you model it, until you can prioritize and model, here are the things that are important and I'm going to let you kind of struggle through these things. It's hard for teachers to think about what that looks like in their own classrooms. The, um, one of the things that I've been doing, and I apologize if I've told this story in another episode, but, um, one of the things that I, I do often in uh, professional learning days is uh, I'll talk about, you know, I, I will talk about, because a lot of people think that if you talk about innovation, what about content and what about knowledge? Nobody's saying content and knowledge is not important. And it drives me crazy when people do this because because it's like all they think about is content and knowledge. I think that, that, that Thomas Friedman quote that's in the book, like nobody cares what you know. They only care what you do with what you know. But it is important you know. And so you, you share this. So I'll share content and ideas. 
um, and then we break stuff down. But a lot of times what I've been doing is I'll pull somebody up uh, when I'm presenting and we'll do like a Twitter video and, and they'll talk about their reflection for learning. And so they, they go up in front, they model their learning in front of everybody. But then I'll say, okay, so you have a 30 minute break, which is like mind blowing. We don't do that enough. We have like 10 minute pee breaks and grab a lunch or grab something to eat. So I'll say you have 30 minutes, but in that 30 minutes, I want you to actually do a video reflection on Twitter. I want you to share it to this hashtag and I want you to uh, do this. And if you don't know what you're doing, not my problem, figure it out. And the only rule for the activity is I will not help you. So you, the teacher is, is the, is the, is actually pulling themselves out of the equation. You figure this out. And what's fascinating about it is this is goes from that notion of engaged versus empowerment. Like I wouldn't put them in a situation I knew they couldn't figure out, but when people realize, like if I showed them step by step, what's the, how much value do they see in it? Cause it's just prescriptive as opposed to tinkering and messing around and doing this. But what's essential is I put them in a situation where they have time to figure it out too, that we say this and we embed it in professional learning days. And somebody said to me, when we, when we do stuff with technology, we expect teachers to do that after school, we'll have a separate session, but when, it, when it's assessment, we're gonna, you know, we'll do that right in school. When it's like, you know, something about, you know, instruction, we're gonna make that in. But technology is a figure you're out on your own time thing. And, and there's ways you can actually embed that in a day. Because I think that the hope is that if you're really good at what you do, you you create a lack of need for yourself, not more dependence. And that's not, that's teachers, leaders, and, um, you know, like, it's leaders and teachers uh, in what we do their students. If they need you, you're in trouble. Well, and I want to build right. on no, I mean of empowerment, George, and that was my reflection this week. Someone, a teacher said recently that I talked to, well, I, if I give my kids voice and choice, I can't, I can't give them any direction. And her, her understanding of voice and choice was that they had to have literally, they had to drive everything and they had to have choice in everything. And so I think your example is really powerful. Um, when we think about empowerment, it doesn't mean that it's a free-for-all. It means there's constraints, and we all have constraints we have to work within, but empowerment to figure it out and to own the learning is what's powerful. And you're there as a teacher. You're there as an administrator to really guide and shape that and set those parameters and kind of help define those constraints, but the learners can, can make some choices within that. It doesn't have to be just do whatever you want. Yeah, I think that that part of the book was one of my favorites when you uh, make the jump from engagement to empowerment, because in my district, we spent a lot of time looking at Schlechty's qualities of an engaging yeah. classroom. And we did we did classroom walkthroughs and we went in and talked to kids like, what are you doing? And um, we were checking off, you know, how many of the engaging qualities did we see? And if we could check off three, we're like, OK, that's an engaged classroom. Again, not a perfect science. But again, there's another step to it, and that's what I like. Because so we were only going from compliance to engagement, and I love. I mean, even compliance isn't a bad thing sometimes. If you're going over safety rules with kids in a in a biology lab or a chemistry lab, even more so, yeah. um, you need the kids to be compliant, right? But I mean, I love um, getting to empowerment because in our district, I know we were setting the bar at engagement, and I don't think that's high enough. Yeah, and I think that compliance is is not. Like, yeah, like you said, there's compliance in our world. Like, I can't get creative with my taxes and just fill out the form whenever I want, how I want, right? There's a process to that. So there is things that you have to be compliant in the world too, but if that is everything you do, and a lot of times when we're looking at our kids, um, we're, we're – a lot of them are like, oh, we're going to prepare them for jobs that don't exist. And I and I, I never say that because I, I don't think it's I, – I, I'm sure there's that's been something forever that we, we right. prepare jobs, you know, like, you know, in the early 1900s, nobody knew there was going to be cars. So that probably opened up some industry and, and, and did all these other things. But I think the, the really important aspect of our world today that is a, is a shift is that are we preparing kids to create – their own opportunities to create the jobs. Like, mm -hmm. a lot, like a lot of people work for themselves. One of my favorite people on YouTube is Philip DeFranco. He's self-made YouTuber that I watch daily for news. And 
Um, is this something he was taught in school that he can create his own path? And, and I, like, I ask a lot of teachers, like, what do you do when a kid, you know, says they want to be a YouTuber? And a lot of teachers laugh at them. I'm like, why would you laugh? That's an opportunity that didn't exist. So I, I think that you can't we, use it in school anyway. Yeah, well, that's insane. <laughs> that's actually a question. Um, but I was going to. Sorry. I was just, I was just going to say, um, I lost my train of thought, so go ahead. <laughs> well, yeah. I was going to ask you, Patrick, and you said like you can't use it in, in school anyway. I'm curious, um, as we're talking about technology and talking about helping kids monitor, what do you guys do in your district? Or, are, are things blocked, or are you opening it up for kids to learn and make those choices in their school? You better not be blocked, Patrick. Um, we've, been, we've, been, <laughs> we've been pretty open since day one, yeah. uh, to be honest with you. And that, that was one of the... Um, one of the complaints of parents, but I mean, of course, we have some filtering. We're compliant with filtering certain war words that may come up, but YouTube's open. Um, social media things are open in the uh, high school because kids are all over 13 years old and we're using them from, uh, we're asking teachers to use them. So, um, you know, we wouldn't ask kids not to use those tools as well. But the thing I was going to say, just to backtrack for one second, and one of my struggles um, as a leader, as a parent um, for my kids is, Talking about that engagement for one more second is you probably saw that Pew Research um, a few years back that had the, the, so there was basically, it showed engagement levels from elementary school to high school. And this is what the slant looked like. And again, I'm, I'm hearing it at home, I'm seeing it in, seeing it in schools, and uh, I think it's a challenge for all of us in leadership positions to, uh, because I would think it would almost be the other way Again, I don't want it to be that way at all, but in school, you would think they'd be able to be given more freedom. They'd be able to go off and do more things that they're passionate about. Um, but it seems to be the exact opposite, at least, um, you know, a lot of the schools that I see. Well, uh, well actually, um, and I'm just looking this up. I actually wrote an article um, talking about this because what <clears throat> what the belief is, is that you know, our elementary classrooms are like super engaging and super exciting. And then eventually, you know, at the high school level, they become boring. But uh, I wrote an article, I think it was, it was in May 2017, I'll tweet it to the hashtag. And what I talk about is basically we condition kids. So like when you uh, show, when you give like stickers for stuff, that's doing something to a kid. They're saying this is not valuable enough uh, for you not to get a reward or something like that too. And so a lot of high school teachers that are trying to do different things, who are trying to um, think differently about how, how they you know, empower their kids are running into these issues where kids are like, just give me the test, like just get me out of here as soon as possible. Like I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna think. Like that would be the worst thing to do in school is actually you know, think and struggle a little bit. And so I, I want to make sure that people don't, and I'm sure, you, I'm not, I know you're not saying that, Patrick, at all, but I think that 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 level goes down because there's no kindergarten kid that walks in and saying, hey, you know, I just made something with clay. What's my grade? Like, they're not asking that. We but, teach them to ask that. And I think that that eventually has an impact on kids where they, do, they lose that. That's one of the big tenets of the book is that, you know, if a kid leaves school, less curious than when they started, we have failed them. And it doesn't just happen in high school all of a sudden. It is conditioned. No, I agree. Well, and that research you, you shared, Patrick, I think it is, it's something that is not just leadership. It's everybody's. I think parents should be interested in it, community members. If we really want kids leaving our schools with a different skill set than they currently have and prepared to do anything, prepared to really make that next step, then we all need to be worried about the engagement level going down. And, you know, it says kids have less opportunities to work, to do things that they feel good about, to do things they enjoy. And we have the opportunity and, um, frankly, I think the obligation in schools to really think about how we can create those opportunities for kids to do things that, um, that they're good at and they enjoy and move from that, like, deficit mindset that is really um, prevalent for everybody in education to looking at what assets kids have and things that they they are good at um, to make things more interesting and relevant. 
Yeah, I went to uh, Ed Camp Seacoast up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire this past weekend, and the last session of the day was Reimagining School was the title somebody put up on the board. And again, it, I just, it, it, was, uh, it was not an uplifting session because it was really a lot of teachers, which was great, um, struggling, knowing that their school is not doing everything it could do to create a education for their kids. And I guess, um, you know, what are the, but, um, I remember when we were going through a change process in one of the other districts I worked in and, uh, you have to talk about like, look, here, put out all the things you're, you're worried about in trying to accomplish this change and people throw out all these different things. Um, and then let's cross out the things that we don't have control over because so many of these things people put out there like are things that they don't ultimately have control over and, and to move forward that way. Um, the thing we do have control over, and I think it's really important that teachers and communities and again, school leaders need to lead this and school leaders, the hard part when I say that is, I don't know what the statistics are in Canada, but I know the statistics in the United States about the tenure of a school administrator is, is relatively short. Um, so if, if a school administrator is the one who's who's coming up with like this is what we're going to do these are the initiatives here's how we're going to do it it's it's not going to take roots it, it really needs to be a, a community endeavor and it comes back to again building those relationships so if school boards or whoever's in charge of hiring school leaders uh, is is going to hire someone they need to hire people that are going to go right in the door um, you know build relationships with folks and find out what the teachers in the community like what what their priorities are, because ultimately it's not going to move forward if those people aren't the ones doing the work um, from the bottom up. Um, because again, I think the shelf life of a school administrator is is somewhere around the average of three years, and that's certainly not enough to um, accomplish any type of significant change in a district. And, and I think one of the like I'm, I'm looking at some of the comments, and uh, it's MLR one 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 one, and <laughs> so super. I don't know who that is, but um, they're talking about uh, GPA and, you know, do colleges kind of drive some of the things that we do in schools? And I think that's kind of like a, a yes and no question. One of the, the reality is you still have to do tests, standardized testing. You still have to, to do a lot of these things. And I think what we have to understand is that that's why I talk about the notion of innovation inside the box. Here are the constraints we work in. Can we, the curriculum tells you a minimum of what you have to do, but it doesn't say, hey, but make sure you don't go beyond. And so you have to go this. But I think that if schools en masse started saying like, look, we're not going to offer the same type of programming and you as colleges are going to have to think differently about how you accept our students. They're, they're like, why is that always, like, why do we feel so helpless to this? And I find it interesting because K-12 complain about colleges saying, well, they're so grades driven. And then I hear colleges say, oh, you're sending us a bunch of kids who can't think. So like, well, maybe we should all talk to each other and, and see if we can figure out a better way. And I think that if, if we ask something different, because at the end of the day, kids are going to make other, other options in college in, in many cases, because they're maybe not seeing it as relevant to them. And if that started happening on mass, um, I bet you colleges would change. I bet you they would think differently what they're doing. And I, I don't think we're as helpless as sometimes we, we say we are. No, I agree. I have a sophomore in college, a senior in high school, freshman in college also, and a bunch of other ones right after that. And um, like, I, I, I'm worried about, you know, paying the money we're paying for college. Like I, I don't, I honestly, um, with with my daughter, I know she's not watching, but she's a senior in high school. If she gets in into some undergraduate school that's going to cost sixty thousand dollars a year, justify two hundred and forty thousand dollars, what what's she going to get at the end of the four years? Like, what's what's she going to have? Um, but to go back to Debt. your point, George. Debt. Uh, yeah. Debt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So to go back to your point about G, like I don't care about GPAs or grades. To be honest with you. Um, what are all the things that the kid learns along the way? What, what the hell does the GPA mean? Like, what do the grades mean? Like, Alice, I think, ranted on grades, and I agree wholeheartedly with her. Um, grade is the lowest amount of feedback you can give a kid. It's like all the things that happen to get to that grade or all the things that happen to get to that GPA. And what are our kids able to show colleges or whoever um, wants to look at their 
portfolio or whatever it's going to be, I'm just going to look at 4.0 or a number on a piece of paper um, because that's the least important thing in my mind. Yeah, and I'll go back to George's point about like we start this really early with kids, conditioning them. I'm shocked when my first grader comes home with a letter grade on a spelling test and a percentage, um, you know, with just in basically evaluating. And I think I wrote about this this week. Are we evaluating what people do or are we really spending time giving them opportunities to learn and give feedback? And too often that first draft or that first attempt becomes the grade. Um, which tells us nothing about learning and nothing about what kids do, except here's what I know at this moment in time. Um, you know, and I see really the impact. My my kids, my seven and eight year olds, coming back and they are seeing their grades, and they're they're deflated. They don't want to try because they they feel like, oh, okay, I have a two on this. Um, there's no there's no point of even getting better at it. There's no there's no attempt. So. Yes, in college it makes a huge difference in high school, but like we have to start this. It's not just the transcript. We have to start this early on thinking about how we communicate, um, how we're learning, and what that means for all of us. So I, I want to mention one thing that kind of struck me. I was in Nashville a couple of weeks ago for a conference, and um, we took a visit to the Nashville Software School. And basically it's a pay place where um, – um, usually I think they're from 18 to like 65, but a lot of the people that are in that school are folks that have just graduated from college and they can't find a job um, given the degree that they have. So they've gone back to the software school and within six months, um, they're learning how to do computer programming and they're getting junior, junior software jobs in companies um, right out of the gate. So going back to your younger kids, Katie, and my sixth grader, Honestly, alternatives other than traditional um, undergraduate school when she graduates high school, something where she's not going to spend $60,000 a year and come out with question marks about what she's going to do afterwards. Are there certifications she can get? Are there other ways she can show um, what she's capable of doing without? I, I, I agree with the superintendent. I know if we're in a community, they worry about what colleges the kid's going to. I get that. But we have to start pushing back in our conversations and, and like and talk to the kids at the end of four years. Yeah, they got into a great school, but what are they doing afterwards? And we need to push back on the colleges, I think, and not and not, you know, just stay with the routine we've been doing for the last however many years. There, there's two things um, I want to address that I'm seeing in the chat. And then, Patrick, I'm going to actually ask you about um, CP chat, connected principles, how we connected. So if you can just hold on that thought for a second, and then if anyone on the chat, uh, in the YouTube stream, or on iMOOC hashtag has questions, uh, please let please let us know. But um, the first the first one, uh, I saw a comment about how a lot of parents are looking at uh, they want to make sure their kids like uh, the one of the comments is about how parents want their kids to go to Ivy League schools, and and you know grades determine that quite a bit. So here's something I want to kind of point out that I always ask people in a room, uh, how many of you went to Harvard? And I always ask this question because I know the majority of people know Harvard, but they have never went there. So I've maybe had 10 people in all the workshops that I do raise their hands. And then I ask the following question, how is Harvard a good school? And everyone's like, well, yeah. I'm like, how do you know that? And it's based on reputation. And so reputation is very important. So the reason why I bring this up is because when we talk about, oh, we got to prepare kids because SATs and grades. But when we talk about kids uh, doing their, their digital footprint and how important that is, a lot of these colleges are looking at that now. So, oh, we're going to do this because colleges want this. Uh, but this is new, and so we don't really care about this as much. And so if that's really important to us, we should be work, working with students. And one of the school districts, I, or a school I worked with in Florida at uh, freshman year in grade nine, every single student takes a branding course and they talk about Twitter, social media, they get the kids online, they're doing portfolios. Because they know if you start that in senior year when they're in grade 12, it's too late that a lot of these colleges are not going to look at these kids. So I, I will be honest with you, that's a private school, but any public school can do this if you have the leadership that says make this happen. 
But the other uh, the other comment I want to address, uh, Carolyn Cormier said, why don't EDU presenters approach conferences like they do P12? Um, do individualized needs disappear after senior year? I, I, I would actually say there's more and more. I hope that I'm one of them. I, I, I do try to let, like one of the things that I'll say is, you know, get out your devices, do whatever you want. If, I, if I'm boring, if you check your email, that's on me. And I want people to go in their different directions. And I think that there's more and more people who are presenting that will give some content and information, but they want people to go in different directions. They want to dig deep. And that's why, like, if you go down a rabbit hole, like I show teachers kinder chat that are kindergarten teachers, and I say, look, if you don't listen to one thing that I say for the rest of the session, and all you do is go through kinder chat and you become a better kindergarten teacher, I don't really care because I've done my job. I've got you, I've turned on a spark in you and share this. So um, I think that there's more and more people that are moving towards this that present at conferences. It's not as much as, you know, hopefully educators would like, but we do have, like, it is important to see that that change is happening in those spaces too. So um, just on that little rant, Patrick, you and I connected years ago uh, when we were both principals and I went on the Twitter because I, I didn't really know that many principals and I only had a very small network within my school district and that's how we met. So I, I just want your th thoughts on like that connection uh, through Connected Principals, CB Chat, any, any of that, how that's impacted you in your work. Well, I mean, when we were first on CP Chat back in the day, I mean, I think there were like, I don't know, a half dozen principals maybe. That was it. Um, there weren't a lot. There were a ton of teachers um, for, to interact with, but there weren't many administrators. So mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden, I, I remember, I think it was like a Saturday or a Sunday because it was definitely a weekend. I get this message from this guy in Canada <laughs> who I had known from Twitter. And I'm like, oh, that's Alex's brother. <laughs> right, George? No. <laughs> so that's Alex, Alex, but dude. now, Chris, now, now and we're gonna stop the broadcast right there. <laughs> he's, so anyway, he's George's George is like, now. hey, I had, he's George's brother now. George, exactly. You can say it, and I, I agree with you. But <laughs> anyway, so this idea to start this connected principles blog, where we could get like a few of those folks that were willing to extend themselves at that time and and share some blog posts and try to grow the audience. And uh, again, it was a game changer for me because it allowed me to connect with people I didn't know and form a relationship with George and I've become good friends with people um, over the years. But it also reminds me, George, we did a session at Educon. Um, I don't know what, like on a similar topic, like how do we draw yeah. more administrators into this conversation? And I remember, you know, this is, it's something I thought a lot about and I've kind of backpedaled because I was all about, oh, you're not on Twitter. What's wrong with you? Um, like I, I was part of the problem there because I thought people had to find me. You know, you have to come to me. And I think John Becker said, um, you know, we have to meet people where we are, mm -hmm. where they are. And so, um, again, he said, you know, write in magazines or write a book. And and not to pump your tires, George, because you don't need anybody to do that. But um, yeah, everyone think, says that know, to me, so nobody does it. Just say it. Just say it. He loves <laughs> right, it. I'm pumping them right now. I'm pumping them right now. Um, so anyway, I was going to go off on a thing about Tim Thomas and Vancouver Canucks, but we won't do, do that right now. So if you want to Google pump your tires, Tim Thomas and Vancouver Canucks, people can do that later. Back to the, back again, to the compliment. Back to the compliment. You, you, you've, you've, created a, you've created a book that, uh, you know, allows people like that would, you know, that have, weren't on social media to get access. And you've connected more people around the country through the book. And I think that's what it's all about, not just, you know, a lot of people, again, back a few years ago, kind of snooty about, oh, they're not on Twitter, they're not on Twitter. Well, they don't know what they're missing, and you need to find them in a place they're comfortable, mm -hmm. and, and that's maybe in a traditional mode, like a book um, or a magazine article, and, and I think, uh, you know, I'm thankful to be connected with you and to get connected with so many more people because of your work. And when, when actually, when we started that, there, there was two, two reasons, I think, that were really important to me. And one you mentioned was like, how do we connect with other principals and learn from them? Because it was such a small network at the time. Uh, but the second one that, that I, I don't really bring up that often, but it was really interesting. Uh, at the time, and this is probably like 2009, 2010, um, 
like a huge chunk of teachers, all they would do is complain about their principals on Twitter and how horrible oh, yeah. principals are and how much they suck and oh, our principal is terrible. And it was actually really interesting because they weren't worried about saying it because their principals would go on Twitter. And so like they're like they were so far behind. I'm like, whoa, 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 like not all of us are like horrible. Like we want to get better and we're trying to learn as well. So it was it was also to to not just connect principals with principals, but to connect teachers and principals to say, like, we're all on the same team. We're 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 trying to help kids. So quit saying every principal is a horrible, you know, educator because there's some of us that are wanting to do this. And like you imagine the opposite if principals went on a Twitter and complain about teachers probably wouldn't go over so well. Yeah, yeah we took a lot of beatings uh, over the years, I think, <laughs> on Twitter because there were no other administrators there. They took out all their frustrations on yeah. us. Yeah, it, it, uh, it was the safest place to bash your principal because no principals yeah, yeah. were there. It was kind of funny. Thankfully, that's um, I just want to throw out one thing for the person that was talking about the Ivy League schools because, um, again, I'm in the midst of this with my own kids. Um, check out the book by Frank Bruni called Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be. Um, it's a great um, perspective taking piece for parents who are worried about their kids and where they're going to go to college. Okay, so I got a question from Kathleen Reardon. Uh, she is at uh, Magistrar Reardon online. And um, Katie or Patrick, please feel free to answer this. Um, how can parents help schools innovate? Two months in the year, and I'm worried my kindergarten kindergartner is receiving rewards for for tracking. So how 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 can parents get involved? Like especially, and I think I'm going to add a little caveat to this: parents that are educators too, where they might be a little bit concerned, right? And, and so, any any thoughts on that, either from either from either of you? I, again, innovation and relationships. The first step for me would be go in and have a conversation with the teacher. Um, and what your expectations are as a parent. And if you have feelings about rewards that may not jive, um, let them know what they are. And again, I think most of the time it's gonna be settled at the classroom level. Don't jump to the, the principal or something higher because you're gonna lose, again, innovation, relationships, trust. You're gonna lose the trust of that teacher early in the year. So give them a chance. Um, teachers are there with good intentions. We all are. Educators are there with good intentions. Um, and have a conversation because it might clear something up. I yeah, I just want to add on to that. Um, I think it's it's a challenge for all of us, and I think it's a great question, and I, it's one I've been certainly wrestling with. But I I agree. I had a a colleague recently who said, I really want something to change in my school, so I have this email drafted. It's going to the superintendent, principal, and it's going to the whole team. And you know, we had this conversation. I just said. Think about your kids and the impact. And if you really want something to change, it's got to be about a conversation. And I am so grateful for my kids' teachers who want to be better and who are really open to thinking about it. I just have to force myself to think about what's important and have that conversation. Um, I talk with my neighbors. I talk with the community. And I think focusing on what we want for kids has to be the goal. And then we can then we can go from there and think about what those practices are and what we want to do. But when we start saying this is right or this is wrong or even bringing in the research says this, I think you're going to put people on the defensive. So you got to start with the relationship. You have to start with the kids, and then you can bring in the resources from there. And so I know when, George talked about problem sorry. problem finders, and I think these two chapters and. Like, don't just be a problem finder. I know it's, it's in a different context, but don't just be a problem finder as a parent um, with your kids' schools. Um, something you're concerned about, come in, but come in with some solutions as well. So we've got uh, one more question, and then I'm gonna ask you for a couple final thoughts. Uh, Joe, Joe, I know, I've known Joe forever. Like, it seems that way, but I can't say his last name. It's Joe Furch. So, Joe, you might have to tweet that out how to, how to actually say it. Um, he says, what is the best argument or way to make, uh, to help districts, if you're from a teacher standpoint, um, that they will open access? So, Patrick, you said you've had open access um, for, for, for forever, um, for as long as you can remember. So, what about a school that isn't? What, how would you help that? leadership team move forward and and katie well the first thing i remember looking at uh 
when we first started that whole idea about devices and and that and what we were going to let kids have access to was looking at our mission statement and you know if we're trying to have kids be ready for the real world um when they get out in the real world like things aren't going to be blocked they can't you don't learn to drive a car by like having the car put up on pegs and sitting behind the steering wheel um you have to like actually do it so leadership team or your it team a lot of times i know it's it can be the stumbling block um please reach out to me i can put you in touch i'll be happy to talk to your superintendent i'll be happy to put my it folks in touch with your it folks to talk about how we allow access but still um, filter and monitor to make sure our kids aren't getting into trouble you know when when they're in school um and again i think i'm hoping you're in the minority if you're still doing this and you're not really you're not preparing kids um, to be productive citizens because you know, you're not teaching 21st century uh, citizenship at this point. Katie, before you answer, because I know you got some thoughts on this, I just want to reiterate something Patrick just said that I think it's really important, is that he just said, like, connect with me, and we'll, we'll kind of show you. I work with so many school districts, they'll say, oh, the state doesn't allow us to do this. I'm like, what are you talking about? And then I'll tweet out, hey, is anyone doing this? Oh, we do that, we do that, we do that. So people using the excuse that other places aren't allowed or blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, other people are doing this in your own state, in your own context. So that that is not, I think that's one of the really powerful things about Twitter is that if you hit that stumbling block, you can actually have evidence of other schools doing this and you can say, how does it work for you? You're not, you're not isolated to your own school or district now. Sorry, Katie, I know you got something to say on this as well. I have plenty to say, but I just, I, I love everything that Patrick said and just thinking about really teaching kids responsibility. A lot of the things we talked about tonight is like self-awareness, monitoring. If we don't give kids opportunities to practice this in a safe space in school, you know, they're doing it regardless of what we're doing in school. They're doing it at home. They're accessing the internet. They're, they're looking at social media. They're connecting with that all the time. So thinking about, I just really urge people to think about how we can create the space where that is something we can do at schools. And for this point, we make assumptions that we can't based on what we've always done. And all of those assumptions are not necessarily law or fact or reality. They're based on what's always happened. And so start asking questions, you know, be, build those relationships with people to start making connections. You don't need to come in and, you know, be the anti everything and we have to do this, but start, start the conversation. And I think a lot can happen. I read a good book back in June. Um, I think it was called Social Media, um, which yep. can help people with those conversations in their schools as well. Good book. Yep, good, good book. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask Patrick, 10-second takeaway. 10-second thought, what you hope people do. Katie, 10-second takeaway. 10-second um, takeaway. Whatever, is, whatever you want to share is your last message to everybody. Um, I start with the person in the mirror and I'm not even close to where I need to be as a school leader, an educator, a learner. And um, so my takeaway is to just try to, you know, make myself better and, and hopefully have conversations about, you know, that work that I'm doing as an individual learner. And uh, hopefully other people will have the courage to have those same conversations and, and talk about it with their kids. Katie? Uh, you win, Patrick. So can I just ditto that? And um, I, if I could add anything to that, I would just say this, um, something I was thinking about earlier in the conversation that we're trying to personalize for everybody and, you know, take this ownership as the educator, as a leader to change things for everybody else. I think the more that you create the context and allow learners to take responsibility, um, we're going to get a lot further. And one final thought for me, there's a, there's a question where I ask, you know, what would be your dream school? Like, what would you actually say? And we asked this, the reason I asked this to show you it's attainable, that in your context, you can actually make this happen, that this is not some far reaching, this is impossible. But how do you take what we dream of? And, and I encourage every single person listening to this uh, live, every person that listens to the podcast or YouTube video, whatever. Go back to your school after you listen to this. Look at everything that goes on in your school. Look at everything on the wall. Pretend it's your first day and start asking questions. Why do we do this? Why is this here? And that will open up some things for you because we get so numb to what we do. So, uh, Katie, thank you so much for 
Um, all you share, uh, if you don't read Katie's blog, you are missing one of the best educational blogs out there. Patrick, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your friendship. Patrick is the nicest uh, person I've ever met in my life. And if you ever want to stay at his house, uh, I'll give you, I'll send the address out later. He's like, we'll open up his doors to anybody. <laughs> it's unbelievably, and his family is absolutely amazing. And so I just want to say how much I, I appreciate both of you. So thank you for taking the time. All the Thanks, people Dave. that listen uh, tonight, thank you for all you do. Have a, have a wonderful night. Thanks. Good night.